Welcome back, everyone, both here at MIT and online, and I know people will drift in. My name's Eric Grimson. I have the pleasure of serving as MIT's Chancellor for Academic Advancement and hold the Bernard M. Gordon Chair in Medical Engineering. I'm very privileged in my job to learn about research across the entire institute, everything that's going on at MIT. And that includes the pick hour. And one of the things that I think is particularly notable about the pick hour is that although the mission is fundamental brain research, it's a great deal of innovation that takes place here as well. Answering new questions often requires inventing new techniques and new methods. And new discoveries, of course, uh, that have clinical relevance often beget the creation of new devices and new therapies. And that's true whether you are involved in creating technologies that enhance research or the research itself that can become even more compelling. So there's this wonderful interplay between the two things. And we're going to hear three great talks at that interplay between innovation, uh, uh, entrepreneurship, if you like, and fundamental issues in brain research. Uh, in this session, we'll hear from three speakers. Um, to my speakers, I'm a stickler for time. So, <laughs> simply warn you, uh, 20 minutes for each speaker, we want to save five minutes for questions. So at 15 minutes, including the introduction, you're going to see me get up and come to the podium. And we don't want to compete because I got a big voice. So I'll just <laughs> warn you about that. With that, um, up first is um, Emery Brown, the um, Edwin Hood Taplin professor here at MIT, who will introduce graduate student Indy Garwood. Her talk is entitled, as you can see, The Dynamics of the Unconscious Brain Under Ketamine Anesthesia. Emery. Great, Harry. Thank you so much. Thanks for all of you for coming. Uh, I'm just going to go right, cut right to the chase and introduce Indy because it's, it, she's the one you might really want to listen to. So I have the good fortune of introducing Indy Garwood. She's a PhD student in my group. She did her undergraduate work at the University of Michigan in bioengineering, got her bachelor's degree there. She graduated summa cum laude. Since being here, she's won an NSF fellowship as well as a MathWorks fellowship. And her, her work really reflects innovation. She's combining three areas. She's working with me on the signal processing with Paulina Anakiva adapting these multi-electrode, multi-functional electrodes to rec that have been used in rats to record now in non-human primates. And in addition, she's working with Earl Miller to actually carry out the experiments to test these. So she's, she's using these probes to study all right, the anesthetic ketamine, and that's what she's going to tell you about. So, Indy. Great. Thank you so much, Emery. Um, I'm really happy to be here for the 20th anniversary of the Pick Hour Institute and to talk to you about ketamine, which is a really fascinating anesthetic. And when you hear anesthesia, your first instinct might not be fascination. I felt a similar way when I first came to MIT, but the first time I met with Emery, I was really stunned by how rich this field is and how intimately connected anesthesia is to some of the central questions uh, today in neuroscience. Um, and I think the reason why anesthesia doesn't immediately strike me this way is because it's incredibly common. Over 60,000 patients undergo general anesthesia every day in the United States alone. General anesthesia is a reversible drug-induced state characterized by unconsciousness, antinociception, immobility, amnesia, and physiological stability. And today I'm going to be focusing on unconsciousness because in our lab, with really careful descriptions of the dynamics in brain activity, we've begun to unravel that mystery that Earl Miller mentioned earlier today and start to understand how anesthetics elicit unconsciousness. And this is really important because characterizing consciousness itself is one of the great challenges in modern neuroscience. There are several theories for how consciousness arises, but there's not a strong consensus. And so we hope that by very carefully characterizing how anesthetics make patients unconscious, we can have a very tangible window into understanding consciousness itself. And on a slightly more practical level, studying anesthesia can help us establish evidence-based guidelines towards optimal administration of anesthesia. So we can start to answer questions like, why do some patients respond differently to anesthesia? How does the safety of anesthesia change with age and health? 
and how can we help anesthesia, anesthesiologists monitor um, brain activity during anesthesia with more detail and potentially aid the development of automated controllers for the delivery of anesthesia. So today I'm gonna to be talking about our efforts to understand brain activity during ketamine anesthesia and some of the techniques that we're developing to study this in greater detail. This is a highly multidisciplinary project at the intersection of systems neuroscience, signal processing and statistics, and technology development. And so as I've alluded, the reason why I think ketamine is so fascinating is because the structure of brain activity during ketamine anesthesia. And we can record brain activity and the electrical signals uh, that emanate from the brain clinically with EEG. And in a research setting, we can record local field potential oscillations in non-human primates. And so in the awake state, the brain oscillates at very specific frequencies that are distributed across the brain. So here we're looking at spectrograms. Um, here we are looking at spectrograms, which show the uh, oscillation of varying frequencies over time. And stronger oscillations are indicated with warmer colors. And just a few short minutes after, um, or well, actually, I, I want to mention that these oscillations during the awake state, as uh, Professor Miller mentioned earlier on, are intimately connected to how the brain processes information. And just a few short minutes after ketamine is delivered, it completely restructures uh, these oscillations. And so to the left of this black line, the animal is awake and consciously performing a task. And to the right, especially in this region, the animal is completely unresponsive. And unlike other anesthetics uh, that tend to slow down the brain, ketamine is unique because it actually disinhibits the cortex and causes these gamma oscillations in the 30 to 80 hertz frequency ranges. And so uh, during ketamine anesthesia, the parts of your brain that are responsible for cognition and sensory processing are actually more active. So how is this associated with unconsciousness? It seems kind of paradoxical, right? And what our research is starting to indicate is that get, dramatically changing the dynamics is associated with the state of unconsciousness. And specifically for ketamine, it's this structure of the activity that we think is intimately related with its uh, behavioral effects. So what do I mean by structure? If we zoom in on uh, that earlier phase with the gamma oscillations, we can see that the gamma oscillations occur in these really distinct bursts. Um, so there are bursts of gamma oscillations separated by these large slow waves, which you can see here in the time series of the LFP and the corresponding spectrogram above. And during these bursts, the neurons are firing at a higher firing rate than they do during the awake state. And between the bursts during the slow wave, they're almost completely silent. And so here we're just looking at raw unprocessed data in that third plot, but every single one of those lines is an action potential. And so below, we can see that the firing rate is oscillating up and down on the same time scale as the gamma bursts. And we've observed this gamma bursting behavior or, or signal in multiple patients um, under ketamine anesthesia, as well as multiple um, species. So I'm showing you non-human primate data here. So this really is a signature of ketamine anesthesia, but we don't really understand what causes this signal to arise. And one of the most important tools uh, in neuroscience is computational models of networks of neurons um, that can help us understand the underlying mechanisms. But to be able to model a signal like this, we have to be able to first quantify the, the signal itself so that we can validate our models. And so we had to establish a statistical toolbox for quantifying this neurophysiology. And our statistical toolbox is based on a hidden Markov model and this approach is able to extract the bursts and very specifically define the frequency content of the bursts as well as their duration and interval, all within a cohesive statistical framework. And this approach enabled this really striking finding. If you estimate this model across record recordings from multiple brain areas, what we found is that the bursts are highly coordinated across multiple brain areas, which you can see here indicated in color. 
So this indicates to us that when one brain area is switched off in one of those suppressions, uh, so there, there's a high probability that multiple other brain areas are also switched off. So if you can agree that conscious processing requires communication between multiple brain areas, you can start to understand how ketamine, by repeatedly shutting off communication between these brain areas, is going to disrupt consciousness. So we're starting to be able to explain the effects of ketamine in more detail, but we still don't really understand the underlying mechanism of these bursts, because after all, ketamine is inhibitory on a single cell level. Ketamine blocks NMDA receptors, which are excitatory receptors in the central nervous system. And so by blocking these excitatory receptors, ketamine makes a neuron less likely to fire. So then how is ketamine associated with these bursts of hyperexcitation? And with our statistical model, as well as computational modeling, we begin to understand that interconnected networks of excitatory and inhibitory cells can generate bursts under two key uh, conditions that occur during ketamine. First, of course, is ketamine trapping, uh, getting, getting trapped in these channels. So what's unique about ketamine is that it's, it only inhibits channels that were recently active. So it only inhibits neurons that were recently very active. And the second conditions that are required for this bursting activity is increased excitatory input to the cortex. Um, and in order to understand this, we have to realize that ketamine is deliver delivered systemically. So it is washed over the entire brain, and uh, NMDA receptors are ubiquit ubiquitous throughout, including in deep brain structures. And as we've heard today, deep brain structures are responsible for modulating the concentration of neurotransmitters throughout the brain. And these neurotransmitters affect cortical excitability. So by affecting deep brain and MDA receptors, ketamine has been shown to dramatically alter the concentration of neurotransmitters in the cortex, including cortical acetylcholine. So ketamine elevates cortical acetylcholine in a dose-dependent fashion. And our hypothesis is that increased cortical acetylcholine during ketamine anesthesia is associated with gamma and therefore associated with the gamma bursts. And so in order to investigate this hypothesis, we have to not only interact with the electrophysiology of the brain, which I've described in detail so far, but also the chemistry of the brain. And at this point, we kind of reach a major technical hurdle because while there are probes and techniques for interacting with both the electrophysiology and chemistry of the brain in patients and non-human primates, there are some major limitations to the existing neurotechnology. A lot of them rely on very large probes that are stiff or fragile. And so there's a mechanical mismatch between the implanted devices and delicate brain tissue. But one of the really great things about being at MIT that a couple of people have mentioned so far is that we're able to form really dynamic collaborations across disciplines. So I'm co-advised by Paulina Anakiva of Brain and Cognitive Sciences and Material Science. And in our lab, we're working to develop multifunctional probes that are so small and so flexible that they nearly disappear in the brain. So this is a cross section of one of the probes and we're able to, with those big channels, well, they're very small in reality, um, locally deliver chemicals uh, that can affect these neurotransmitter receptors. And then we can record that effect with the integrated electrodes. And uh, so I took probes in, in my PhD work that we had been using in mice and I translated them to be able to work with standard uh, non-human primate experimental setups. And we recently translated these fibers to non-human primates and used them in experiments for the first time in Earl Miller's lab. And I didn't mention it at the time, but this data that I showed you from the premotor cortex was actually recorded with these multifunctional fibers. So you can see that we're able to record really high quality electrophysiology um, and get detailed insights. And now we're using these probes to test the hypothesis that elevated acetylcholine is associated with uh, ketamine neurophysiology. So um, our experimental timeline looks a little like this. After a baseline period, we deliver a bolus of ketamine intramuscularly. And then there is an induction period where the effect of ketamine ramps up and then stabilizes. And at that point, we deliver uh, either mecamolamine, which is an acetylcholine receptor inhibitor, or a control compound. 
And in these experiments, as you might imagine, these control compounds are really critical because there are a lot of changing dynamics going on um, and they're interrelated. So be able, to be able to understand the effect of our mecamolamine injections, we have to have a really direct time-locked control. And so here are four recordings from four different experiments. Um, and on the left are recordings where we delivered the control compound, which is artificial cerebrospinal fluid. And on the right, we have our acetylcholine receptor antagonist. And so your first impression might be that there's no difference between these plots. Um, and this is because the concentrations that we're working with, uh, there's a pretty subtle effect. We're not completely disrupting the bursting activity, but you might be able to see that there is a decrease in the gamma power during these bursts with uh, the mecamolamine injections. And if we take a step back and compare time-locked data sections between ACSF and MEC, we can see that there is a consistent drop in gamma power um, with the acetylcholine receptor inhibition. So this is consistent with our hypothesis that elevated acetylcholine during ketamine is associated with gamma. Um, and uh, yes. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and really, uncovering ketamine dynamics offers a path forward in multiple ways. By automatically detecting this bursting activity, we are improving our ability to monitor uh, ketamine anesthesia in real time. By doing these experiments and investigating ketamine mechanisms, we're really starting to understand with more and more detail that to understand ketamine, we can't just look at its molecular and pharmacological effects, but we really have to think about its effects on a systems neuroscience level. And finally, by looking at this physiology across multiple brain areas, we're beginning to have some insight into how ketamine disrupts consciousness. So moving forward, we're really interested in asking, is there a one-to-one -one relationship between this bursting and unresponsiveness? Does altering gamma in one brain area affect coordination across multiple areas? And ultimately, this research is going to help us to understand which dynamics are crucial elements of consciousness and which ones um, are, are critical to maintaining consciousness. So with that, I would like to thank my advisors, Emery Brown and Paulina Anakiva, um, especially Emery. I am here kind of speaking in his slot, and I'm really honored and humbled to be able to speak to, or during the, the 20th anniversary of the Pick Hour Institute. I also want to specifically thank, thank uh, Alex Major. He's been really instrumental to all of the experiments that I showed today, as well as Ellie Adam, whose uh, computational modeling work is really critical to the hypotheses that I've developed. I want to thank the rest of my team, the rest of my labs, and you all for listening. Thank you, Indy, and thank you for setting a standard of finishing on time. I appreciate it. <laughs> Questions? We'll take the gentleman down here. Uh, across the street in the old Building 20 in the 70s, C. Raymond and Jerry Ledman did experiments on single unit uh, recovery, and they uh, found for gas anesthetics that at the concentration at which uh, the, the anesthetics became effective, um, uh, at general anesthesia, the super excitable phase of neuronal threshold recovery was abolished. So uh, uh, in thinking about that, you might try gas anesthetics where you can control the concentration very precisely, and you can then look at you know, sub-effective sub versus super-effective levels of concentration and see what the changes are. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you for that insight. Um, in case anybody didn't hear that, he was kind of talking about how with gas anesthetics, we can very carefully titrate the dose in order to kind of figure out the exact point where uh, the, the neural dynamics change. Is that an all right summary? Yeah. Uh, so over century ago compared different uh, anesthetic agents and found the concentrations at which they all become effective of that, and there was a hypothesis about lipid solubility and all that. But um, it'd be worth it to try to control the level of anesthesia. 
Yeah, yeah. So in our group, we're studying multiple anesthetics. Uh, we definitely do look at the gas anesthetics as well as propofol. Uh, and those are generally GABAergic uh, drugs. And uh, but we're also, you know, really interested in ketamine because, like I mentioned earlier on, it has this really unique effect on the brain that, at first glance, seems paradoxical. Um, and, and that's really what we're interested in, in characterizing here and how. Different anesthetics can cause completely different dynamics, but still all cause unconsciousness. Um, but yeah, carefully titrating the dose is something that we're really interested in moving forward with ketamine as well. Thank you. Take a question down here. Um, somewhat extending that question. So, you know, the um, brain oscillation and synchrony effects that we see with uh, anesthetic doses of ketamine. How similar are they to, let's say, antidepressant dose of ketamine? Ask you to repeat the question. Thanks. Yeah, so the question was kind of the dynamics that we observe uh, with anesthetic doses of ketamine. How does that compare to the dynamics that occur with uh, sub anesthetic doses that are used right now for treating uh, depression? And uh, I would say that that research is definitely still in development, but what they really are seeing um, is that instead of this bursting gamma activity, just an elevation of activity in the gamma frequency ranges without those kind of hard cuts between. And that's what we see kind of in the recovery phase uh, from anesthetic doses as well. Um, so there definitely is a difference, and there might not be such a kind of like rigid structure between brain areas, but I expect that what you would see if you recorded from multiple brain areas is elevated gamma, which could be related to the therapeutic effects. So, Indy, I'm going to ask the last question. I hope you can give a short answer. You're combining research from multiple areas, and you've already kind of hinted that's one of the things that's exciting about MIT. What's the biggest challenge? And what's the biggest opportunity about trying to bring together so many areas into one wonderful project? Short answer, yeah. That's a good, it's a great question. I think like one thing that was really important for me to realize with the development of these probes is I couldn't just have you know, the fibers that would be really useful for the lab. I had to make it so that they could just like perfectly plug into their existing setup. Um, and, and that was really eye-opening to me when I got to the point where I was asking them if they would let me try these out and they were like, you know, what are you thinking? You have to make it really easy for these kind of cross-discipline collaborations to be successful, especially on the timeline of a PhD. Um, uh, and uh, the you opportunities moving forward, challenge. yeah, <laughs> my goodness. There are a lot and I'm really excited to, uh, you know, potentially explore those in my future lab. Excellent. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Thank you.